Okay, so some of the basic tools that you'll need for uh, the hobby welding. Um, we'll start with, you know, eye protection. Of course, you're going to need a welding mask, and in this case, I've chosen an auto darkening welding mask, uh, which, you know, it's not that expensive. It's uh, between 30 and 50 bucks. Um, auto darkening means that uh, once you strike the arc, it will automatically trigger the visor to darken to protect your eyes from the UV radiation and from the brightness you know from when you're welding uh, next underneath that you want to wear your basic safety glasses because when you remove your visor uh, to take away the slag to hammer off the slag or chip off the slag um, you know you, you want to make sure that you don't get any in your eye and in front of that you will see that that's a handheld uh, welding mask you know that's for any any uh, spectators or you know people that are uh, around that want to watch you do it and then you've got your gloves to protect your hands and uh, an apron and you also want to wear uh, you know a long sleeve shirt or a sweater that's preferably 100 percent cotton uh, so it doesn't catch on fire any any natural fiber materials will work great and uh, you know denim uh, you want to wear some jeans and then next we've got the wire cutters, which we'll need in uh, this type of welding to cut uh, the wire. Uh, and I'll show you, you know, you'll see why you'll need those. Then uh, you want to get some pliers. Uh, I've got some channel lock pliers. Um, you know, vice grips work great. Uh, that's so you can hold on to your uh, weldment um, because it's going to be very hot when you get done with welding. And you'll need to hold on to it to chip away the slag or to use the wire brush to clean it up. So, you know, that uh, those are your basic items. So here you've got your basic flux core wire welder, which is great for hobbies because it's inexpensive. It's very easy to use. Uh, it's very mobile. You don't need a gas tank or anything like that. Um, you know, because as the name implies, a flux core wire welder, the uh, wire that it uses has flux, which the flux, what that does is uh, it's incorporated into the wire, and when you strike the arc, the heat will actually uh, evaporate the flux inside the wire, which will create a shielding gas, uh, mainly CO2. And that shielding, shielding gas will prevent uh, things like nitrogen and oxygen uh, and humidity from getting into your weld, you know, which are the basic components of the air that you breathe, you know, the atmosphere. And those are very harmful for your weld. So, um, for example, nitrogen, you know, the air's comprised uh, mainly of nitrogen, you know, anywhere from 78% to 80% nitrogen, and nitrogen causes porosity in your weld, which means, you know, make it weak and brittle. And, um, I mean, same thing goes for the oxygen and humidity that will cause corrosion, you know, rust. Uh, those are things you definitely don't want in your weld because they'll compromise the strength of your weld. So here you can see this is, uh, you know, the business end of your flux core wire welder. Uh, it's very similar to a MIG welder or a um, gas metal arc welder, which is a little bit different, but it's very similar. Um, it uses gas instead of flux, and uh, they're a little bit more expensive, and they yield a little bit better looking welds, but you know, with this flux core wire welder, I'm gonna show you uh, how you can get some really professional looking welds uh, very easily without you know, having a lot of experience or uh, having high-end equipment. And um, you know, also, you're going to have the grounding clamp that's going to be clamped to your workpiece, and uh, that completes the circuit. So this is a, a form of metal arc welding, so you've got to uh, close the circuit for your current to flow, which uh, your current is what produces the heat that will fuse the two pieces of metal together. And uh, you can select two types of settings for your current, minimum or maximum. You know, and again, keep in mind, this is a very basic welder, but it definitely does the job. And here, you can adjust your wire feed speed, which also corresponds to uh, your current. The faster the wire is going, the higher the current to produce more heat to melt that wire. So, uh, you know, you want to adjust this based on the thickness of your material. So you've got your basic spool of flux core wire, which is usually included when you purchase a wire welder. And uh, it's fed into, you know, through the hose and into the and out of the nozzle uh, through this mechanism here, which you've got the uh, wire tensioner, which pushes this 
you know, this wheel against the wire, in which there's a motor that will, you know, force the wire through. And uh, you definitely want to just follow your instructions you know, that come in the instruction manual that comes with it because um, you want to make sure that there's enough tension on the wire so that when your wire is pushed up against the metal that it's not going to be jammed inside your hose. And uh, another nice feature of your basic flux core wire welder, uh, you know, as a hobby welder, uh, if you don't have an elaborate machine shop, this welder is great because it just runs off of your standard 120 volt AC current, which is really just uh, what any any home has. You just really plug it into your standard outlet. So um, your three prong grounded outlet or grounded plug goes into you know any household 120 volt AC outlet, and uh, that makes it easy because you can pretty much just you know use it anywhere that you've got your standard power source. Now, when you're using a flux core wire welder that uh, is not rated for very high amperage and you're welding some uh, thicker steel, for example, I have some uh, 1 8 inch thick, uh, just some regular hot rolled steel, and um, if I want to do a butt joint where I weld these together, you know, it's perfectly possible to do it without any kind of joint preparation, but uh, you know, if you if you have a welder that's you know not of the highest quality, um, you know, especially to uh, prevent spatter and uh, inclusions and, and other things like that, you want to go ahead and do a little bit of a joint preparation just to make it easier on yourself. So what I mean by that is uh, you just use a simple bench grinder and uh, you just kind of bevel the edges just a little bit, and also uh, to prevent spatter. Um, I figured, a, figured out a trick if you're not one of the best welders or if you don't have one of the best uh, welders as far as equipment. Um, I'll go ahead and show you a little trick here in a little bit. Just kind of hold it at a rough, you know, 45 degree angle to start out with. Um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and start at a 30 degree angle like this. After you do both sides, you know, it's, it's going to look something similar to this where you have a groove going down the middle and, uh, you know, that's where your uh, flux core wire will go into. The weld bead will, you know, go across that. You want to trim your wire using the wire cutters to the proper length and, uh, you know, that's anywhere from 3 eighths to half an inch. So make sure the welder is off, of course, when you're touching the wire. And um, the, the motions that you want to make when you're welding is just like you're drawing uh, a you know, continuous string of cursive E's, you know, just kind of, uh, and the travel speed corresponds to the thickness of the material and how much current you're working with, so you always want to do a test piece before you start welding your actual work piece, uh, but a good rule of thumb is to go at the amount of um, thickness of your material per second, so in this case, you would be an eighth of an inch per second is how fast I want to travel, and you just want to make these small little loops as you go, just to make sure that you're covering both sides of the material. The trick to minimizing the amount of spatter that uh, results from welding and gets on your material uh, is to put down some material that covers it, so, you know, it's very simple but effective, and uh, in this case I'm using aluminum. So it might be kind of hard to see, but I've got my, my metal that I've prepared underneath it and leaving just enough room for the, uh, the weld bead to go across here. And uh, to hold them in place, I've got these handy little guys. They're magnetic. Um, they're also great for if you want to weld some T-joints. Okay, so I've uh, got the machine turned on and everything. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put my gloves on. I'm fully protected. Put my visor down.
So, after you've finished welding, you want to go ahead and grab the workpiece with your pliers, and uh, you can see the slag. Uh, there's a little bit of spatter, but that's what this is for. It's a little slag chipping hammer with a wire brush, but um, you know a lot of this, a lot of the spatter uh, went onto the aluminum, and uh, you can tell that you know that would have been on your workpiece if you wouldn't have had it covered up. So uh, definitely saves you a big headache, even though it is possible to still remove that from your workpiece. Uh, just saves you a lot of time and uh, you can never get it quite perfect so let me go ahead and show you um, you, can, you can start to hammer away to chip away the slag right after you started welding uh, sometimes uh, I've noticed it's a little easier after you've let the workpiece cool down you know due to thermal expansion and then the inverse of that the, the metal is shrinking back down so it makes it a little bit easier and uh, you don't have to hit it hard So by looking at the back of the workpiece, you can tell, uh, you know, it's called the heat affected zone, or sometimes it's abbreviated HAZ, but you can see the heat pattern here, you know, that kind of gives you an indication of your penetration. So, you know, that's what the weld looks like here, and, um, you know, I am no expert welder by any means, and I made plenty of mistakes on, uh, on that pass and uh, some of that was due to you know some of the things were in my way but um, you can tell that it turned out okay I mean there's no spatter here um, on the sides of the weld bead and um, I went ahead and did both sides so you don't have to do that but it's of course going to reinforce your weld it's going to make it much stronger and a good weld always is it's always going to be stronger than the material around it. So if this was to be put in a universal tensile testing machine where they pull it apart, then it would break anywhere but where the weld seam is. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just uh, show you a neat little trick how to get some, how to get your T joints uh, looking good and uh, making it a little bit easier. Uh, you can kind of see that I tried and kind of messed up. I just didn't. Uh, didn't hold it there long enough, so I'm going to tack it in place on one side, but um, I didn't uh, I didn't have either enough current or I didn't hold it in place long enough because the material was too thick. So I'm going to give it another shot and hopefully get it this time, but just uh, place that there. And then you get your right angle, uh, I don't know even what to call it, but it's a little helping uh, thing. It just, it's magnetic and holds it in place. So. Set it down like that, kind of adjust it how you want it, tack it in place. Okay, so one of, one of the things that's uh, working against me here is that the uh, circuit breaker in my house keeps getting tripped. And that brings me to another point. Um, these welders, you know, the less expensive they are, uh, the uh, lower type of duty cycle they can handle. And a duty cycle, so what that talks about is for how long you can weld at one time and uh, for a continuous period of time. So with this welder that I've got here, it is, uh, you can weld for one minute and then you need nine minutes off. And that's if you're working with the maximum current. This is a 90 amp welder. And so if I'm working towards the maximum current, which I need for this thicker material and it's steel, then, you know, um, that's a 10% duty cycle, which means it's really just going to let you weld for one minute and then you need to give it nine minutes of time to cool off. So you just turn it off, take a break. So even without using cover, um, the aluminum covers this T-section, you know, T joint turned out to be, uh, you know, turned out to look relatively okay. Uh, it takes takes some practice getting the technique down to where you minimize the spatter, and uh, you don't get it to look like that. <laughs> There's a lot. There are a lot of inclusions there, and um, yeah, that that's just not a good weld. Uh, 
that's definitely not going to have any structural in integrity and it just doesn't look good so you know to get it to look like that uh, it's not hard you just need a little bit of practice so uh, just to, for comparison you know this is the flux core wire welding and then um, here you've got an example of uh, stick welding so that's where you use uh, an electrode that's like a stick and uh, it's a very similar concept it's covered in a uh, flux that metal rod is covered in flux and you use a metal rod um, instead of a wire this is MIG welding which is very similar to the flux core wire welding you use a wire but instead of flux you use actual um, you use gas usually it's argon or a mixture of argon and CO2 um, it's a lot lot cleaner looking than uh, if you use the flux core wire wire welder but it's also a lot more expensive and uh, you know you, to move it around it's not as easy because you've got a big gas uh, bottle this is TIG welding which is uh, tungsten inert gas welding it uses a tungsten electrode and it's the most difficult form of welding you also use an argon gas um, or you know an inert gas and uh, you have a foot pedal and uh, a, a, a tungsten electrode that you're holding in one hand and then you're feeding the wire in manually with your other hand so there are a lot of things going on and it's, it's very difficult but that's for very it's for precision welding you know for very fine detail and uh, you know this doesn't look very good by any means but just for comparison you can see that the uh, heat affected zone is also on the front you know as opposed to the back uh, there's also a heat affected zone there but you know that's from the uh, from the TIG welding which hopefully we'll have a tutorial on that coming soon